Thanks very much for coming along tonight. My name is James Everett, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of our evening at Egan Discussions, which in truth is a um, continuation of a discussion we started last year at the evening at Egan's about predator management that provoked quite a bit of comment and from the community as well as uh, within UAS. So we're continuing that this year with uh, Dr. Kim Titus tonight. and. Um, We'll conclude the fall session of the evening at Egan's with a return to this subject um, as well. So we will have covered a fair amount of ground together about a fairly controversial and but interesting set of issues related to predator management. I wanted to uh, make sure that you understood how important evening at Egan is for us here. Uh, we are uh, anxious to see the continuation and the growth of evening at Egan. Our hope this year is to pull together a more interactive and accessible set of resources based on each of the topics that you hear so that the community can turn to us as a repository of uh, information and materials if you have a interest in continuing your uh, interaction with these topics. So we're hoping to build really a lot of opportunities for us to engage with you as a community um, and promote and help refine our understanding of the issues and discussions that we have um, here at Evening at Egan. I want to uh, mention a couple of pieces about what's going to happen this uh, year for Evening at Egan. We are, we've got a number of really interesting discussions for you that will move us through um, discussions about seabirds, clay, Afghanistan, oil spills, some wonderful pianos, and uh, finally end up with predator control as a concluding point uh, for uh, these discussions. Next week, uh, one of our own faculty members, Robin Walls, will be offering what Monty Python would surely call a dramatic change of pace uh, and something completely different when he explores the arena of rogue cops, elegant, criminal, elegant criminals, and the popular French crime novel. So um, I'd encourage your attendance. It's the, one of the topic areas that includes discussion of Miss Marple, who my daughter assures me I should never mention in public for fear of dating myself quite thoroughly. But I'd encourage you to attend. Robin is an engaging and um, well-traveled uh, international scholar that we have here on our faculty, and if you haven't heard him speak, uh, I'd encourage you to come uh, next week. So on to our guest this evening, Dr. Kim Titus, who is going to talk to us about predator and prey management in Alaska, and as I said, is a continuation of a theme that we started last uh, semester. Dr. Titus began a 20-year career with Alaska Fish and Game, uh, starting with brown bear research uh, here in the southeast. He served as a regional supervisor for southeast Alaska with a focus on uh, Tongass forest management issues and um, has served as deputy director for the Division of Wildlife Conservation from 2003 to 2009. He's currently the chief wildlife scientist for the Division of Wildlife Conservation and got his degree from the University of Maryland, his PhD. So uh, with little further ado, I'll turn the proceedings to Dr. Titus. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, James, and thank you, Chancellor Pugh and the others from the university that have invited me here to talk about this tonight. And uh, I don't actually view this that much as a follow-up from the discussion last year that uh, Dr. Simon had, but uh, I think in some ways it could be considered that. And uh, anyway, I'm going to talk about a subject for a few minutes here that isn't actually my favorite subject to talk about. I'd rather talk about brown bear ecology or bird of prey ecology or things like that. But nevertheless, I've been in the middle of this issue for the last six years. And in fact, there's some people in the audience that have been in the middle of this issue for uh, longer than I have. And uh, for those of us that work for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and move up through the uh, hierarchy in the agency and those of us in Southeast that have been largely can be immune from this issue as I was for many years as regional supervisor and researcher. Once you move to headquarters, you find out that this issue really eats you for lunch. And uh, 
it uh, has continued to do so, and so I'm going to give you some information as I understand it here, both some science, some policy, and politics, because they all sort of blend together in this form. So once again, thanks for everybody coming here this evening. Well, there's a short story here, so I'll just go through the frequently asked questions at the beginning. So if you really want to go catch something in the arts and humanities or something else tonight, you can get up and leave after about six minutes. Why actively manage large predators? Well, first, it's the law. It's something we have to do according to statute in Alaska. Second, many Alaskans, in fact, want it. Third, recent governors, the last three, for example, say it's OK, and they say, go do it. Fourth, moose are Alaska's cattle and, in many ways, Alaska's food, as I'll show you in a little while. Fifth, all of the above. Sixth, none of the above, because one through four are pretty lame and we don't like it. Another set of questions. Why actively manage mar large predators? Seven, everybody does it. Federal agencies do it. There's coyote killing programs. There's four or five other predator management programs going on in Alaska, most of which you've never heard of, including fox control, mink control, and other things like that. Uh, wolf control specifically has occurred for a number of years in Idaho, Montana, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, mostly associated with the agriculture and cattle industry, even though they're endangered and federally listed down there and recently delisted. Why do it? Well, we do have science behind it, but science informs people. It doesn't make decisions in and of itself. Why not actively manage large predators like wolves and bears? First, uh, many consider it an outdated policy. It's something that's outlived its usefulness, and uh, it's, it, time has moved on, and we should also not do it anymore. Second, many Alaskans oppose it. Third, some people say we have little or no science affiliated with it. I somewhat disagree with that. Fourth, everybody doesn't do it. State of California, in fact, had some referendums and they can no longer, even their state fish and game agency can't manage some of their large predators, such as cougars, that they struggle with because cougars kill and eat people in California. Fifth, uh, one reason you really might not want to do it is some people suggest it's not really for subsistence use. And therefore, they say urban hunters, individuals such as myself, uh, benefit from it. So those are some, some of the venues that we have to deal with relative to this thorny subject of, of predator management in Alaska. Are there places in southeast Alaska that are covered by the intensive management law? Predator control is an area about this big as far as the Department of Fish and Game sees it, and intensive management is a much larger arena, as I'll explain in a little while. Do we have, does the intensive management law actually apply in southeast? Well, actually, the answer is yes. Many of the deer herds in southeast that are, are uh, like Prince of Wales, Admiralty, Chichagoff, Baranoff Islands, are in fact listed as uh, herds that are managed for intensive management. But it's not practical in southeast, therefore there are no regulations for, intense, for predator control or predator management down here. Has there ever been a request for wolf control in southeast Alaska in recent years? Yep, sure has. The Haines Advisory Committee has requested wolf control, but the Board of Game has cons consistently turned this request down. Does the Board of Game approve predator management everywhere, predator control? No, the Board, in fact, in, in my sitting through the Board of Game meetings for six years where every one of these subjects has come up, the Board has turned down many more requests than they have approved. So hunting versus control, you know, many of the verbiage that you hear out of the department is we talk about control programs and we talk about hunting programs. Are they different and who cares? Well, we care from a legal standpoint and from uh, the Board of Game cares from a fair chase standpoint in that hunting and trapping are used uh, first by the Board to manage predators like, just like ungulates. We have moose seasons and we have wolf seasons in bag limits in this state. And however, these control regulations where we actively go in and, and cull wolves and now and bears in some cases, they're distinct. They're distinct in the regulatory system. And they allow methods that uh, many consider out of bounds or otherwise illegal as hunting. Not unlike the programs that are used by the federal government to do things like control coyotes uh, in uh, lower 48 by the USDA APHIS. 
So why is this whole subject so complex? First, the science and our understanding occurs at a landscape scale. These are large programs that are going over on many thousands of square miles in Alaska. Some argue too large. But nevertheless, what that means from an ecological standpoint, in my training as an ecologist, it's these, these are complex ecological systems. They include different types of habitat, different quality habitats across the state, different suites of predators, and they, different suites of prey. And of course, we have a human element overlaying all of this. And third, we have a various sets of values, social issues that, in my opinion, actually dominate the issue more than the science and management does. So, if you really got to go catch another show or something around town, that's the quick and dirty aspect of the presentation tonight. But if you want to hear some more, stay around and I'll go into a little more detail. So first I'm going to discuss the history of the probe, what, what, in abbreviated history. There's some in the audience here that know far more about it than I do and have worked for other governors and previous governors about what's happened and hasn't happened. I'll talk about some of the predator management programs in Alaska. I'll really go through a little bit of the statutes, regulations, and policies for increasing ungulates. And one thing I guess I'd like to emphasize a little bit as a civics lesson is statutes and laws are those that are put forward by the Alaska legislature and signed by the governor and adopted into law. In the case of what we operate under in the, in the Department of Fish and Game, regulations are put forward by the Board of Game and the Board of Fish puts forward fisheries regulations. And policies are then enacted by administrations, whether it be the federal government or, in my case, state government. So what we have under that is the intensive management law. We have state and federal subsistence laws. And those are things I'm all going to discuss. Next, I'm going to talk about some of the science and the state of knowledge as I see it. And I'm just going to give you two examples. We have more work going on than that. I'll also briefly mention this National Academy of Science report and book. This is a book put forward in 1997 under the Knowles administration, uh, affiliate, a review of predator wolves, bears, and their prey in Alaska. has a number of recommendations that we either get uh, people think we're doing or some other individuals think we're not doing very well. I'll talk at the program goals and a little bit about the cost of this type of management, and then I'll have some concluding remarks. Let me start first by saying, who are these key players in Alaska's predator management debate? I suggest, and many may disagree, that at the top of the list should certainly be Alaskans. Many might suggest that Alaskans and the public at large may be at the bottom of the list as opposed to the top, but at least in theory and civics, uh, they should be certainly at the top. Certainly another individual at the top are the governors of the respective, at that respective time and how they institute these policies. Uh, the Alaska legislature has had a big say in these policies, both from the standpoint of things like the intensive management law and the amount of funding we either get or don't get to enact these programs. Certainly the Board of Game is considered a major player, lots of letters to the editor, lots of articles written about what the board is or isn't doing relative to this subject of predator management in Alaska. Fairly far down on the list is, the, is actually the department I work for, the Department of Fish and Game, and we go enact those policies through the administration and the laws that are made. And another group of people that I think are pretty important in this debate are federal land managers because they can either allow or not allow these programs to take place on the lands that they manage. Well, in terms of the history, there is a history of predator control and predator control debates in Alaska that predate statehood. Predators were controlled prior to statehood, particularly large predators, and they kept moose numbers at high, at high numbers. Some people have now suggested that there may have been some major fire events in interior Alaska that also helped moose in particular and ungulate populations uh, 50 or more years ago. And as a result of that, when we became a, a state, a few things happened. First of all, poison no, was no longer allowed to be used and continues to not be used uh, to, uh, for predator control in Alaska. And we've had various state policies have changed under different administrations. This, in fact, this photo is a photo of Priscilla Farrell at, I believe, the, uh, the Wolf Summit held under then Governor Hickel in Fairbanks. Um, a number of years ago. 
So through all of this, we've had planning and stakeholder processes, public land and shoot programs. That's where you fly an airplane, you land the airplane, and you shoot the wolf. Wolf reduction programs using state employees. They've come and gone over the years. We've had threats and or realistic or otherwise of tourism boycotts. We've had voter initiatives, voter referendums, and we have lawsuits which are going on presently. So in terms of a little more history, in 1994, we had control efforts were suspended by, I think, then Governor Knowles. And uh, in 1994, Governor Knowles also sanctioned this National Academy of Science review. And that review, depending on you, how you read this book and how critically you read this book, there's sort of something for everybody in here. It's written in a fairly innocuous manner and fairly carefully edited. So you can pick sentences out of it, whether you're either for or against this particular subject. And in general, the report indicated we were doing a pretty good job, and our work in terms of management was based on science. But the report certainly emphasized that we should be doing more, and we should be doing more of these large and grand scale uh, ecosystem level experiments out there. They indicated that wolf control would be costly, controversial, and time consuming if that was their major uh, we paid a lot of money for this National Academy review, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I think we could have come up with that conclusion without the National Academy. I think many Alaskans knew that already. The results have been used by both critics and supporters of these programs. At that same time, in 1994, the intensive management law passed. I'll talk a little bit about more about that because it's really one of the central themes about what we're required to do and why various administrations do or don't do it. And in 2002, the administration's support for predator management began more in earnest. There's another major underlying theme here that is hotly debated, and in fact is going to go to the Alaska Supreme Court here within the next, it's going there and they haven't heard it yet. And that is associated with the sustained yield clause in the Constitution. And our Constitution, which is fairly unique for state constitutions, directs us that our natural resources shall be developed for the maximum benefit of the people and that the natural resources such as wildlife shall be maintained, utilized, and otherwise uh, managed under the sustained yield principle. Notice that the word maximum sustained yield is not in that phrase. So this sustained yield principle is certainly central to our wildlife management programs and fisheries management as well. Well, that's one set of laws out there, and there are certainly some other laws protecting subsistence. Um, and I think they're actually fairly central to this whole discussion. First of all, we have the state of Alaska uh, notion that all Alaskans have access to subsistence resources. We have ANILCA, the Alaska National Interest Lands Claim Act, where rural, rural residents have a preference to the resource in times of shortage. And through that, we are charged with maintaining the subs subsistence use of fish, wildlife, and game. There's cultural aspects to subsistence in Alaska that we're all aware of. It's a way of life. It's an economy of effort. And it's to foster and protect the high use of game, which we're charged to do then under subsistence laws. As I said, we have a state subsistence statute in law. It hasn't been changed in a number of years. Some people have thought about doing it, but it has never come to fruition. And in that, we identify game populations that are customarily taken and used for subsistence. And the harvest consists, must be consistent with sustained yield. The Board of Game is required to identify the amount reasonably necessary for subsistence. This jargon is also often called ANS, amounts necessary for subsistence. These issues, you don't hear about them that much in Juneau. You go to the other parts of the state in the northwest Alaska, and these are pretty central issues up there because subsistence uses come off the top. And so therefore, the Board spends a lot of time, if you go to a meeting in Nome or Kotzebue, these are pretty darn important issues. And as I said, you don't hear about them as much down here because things like deer don't tend to be nearly as limiting as moose or caribou are in some places in the state. So what the board then does is they have to adopt regulations providing for a reasonable opportunity for subsistence. Well, what happens if moose, caribou, or deer populations are too low? And what is too low? Well, what happens then is the intensive management law kicks in to increase ungulates. Well, as we all know in this state, um, Alaskans do depend on fish and wildlife for food, and I can't emphasize that enough. They, 
They provide an affordable food source for many rural residents. And in Alaska, about 25,000 caribou and 7,000 moose are harvested annually. Many urban Alaskans, such as myself, also prefer wild meat, and probably many of you in this audience tonight. Hunting is certainly important to the Alaska lifestyle, heritage, and culture. And as I said, subsistence is a priority under state and federal law. Well, how important is this meat that's harvested by some of these Alaskans? Well, it varies widely across the state. This is based on some work from our subsistence division that's, in fact, I published recently in a paper that's up front here. And it's the pounds of edible meat obtained per capita by hunting. This is not fishing. And as you can see, for even communities like Angoon, Cordova, Kodiak, coastal communities, the number of pounds per capita is very low. But you go up into interior Alaska to places like Nikolai and Chungnak, where there aren't major salmon runs, and edible red meat is a very important part of their diet. Chungnak, 261 pounds per capita per person per year in a community like that. Well, how does this compare to red meat consumption across the United States? And how, how does Alaska, how much of this wild harvested game is in fact used by Alaska relative to the national average? This is some information a colleague of mine, Tom Paragai, has collected with uh, some Jennifer Schmidt from the University of Alaska and put together and compiled some various information. This solid line represents the Department of Agriculture national average of about, oh, 100 or so pounds of red meat consumed per person per year, U.S. per capita. Well, how does this relate to Alaskans and the wild game harvested by Alaskans in 1994 and 2000? Well, what you see is for these communities down here, like Juneau, you see a very small amount of red, of wild game that's consumed. So this area in between is probably either fish that we consume here in a coastal community, or it's red meat that we buy in the grocery store, or chicken, or things like that. What is you, you look out towards western Alaska, the Arctic, rural, interior, and western Alaska, you can see that virtually all of the red meat consumed by those folks is coming uh, from the harvest of wild game. So it's very, very different from what we experience in Juneau. Well, how does that all relate to what we're charged to do as managers? As I said a minute ago, the intensive management law was passed in 1994. It was changed various, it was amended various times back then. And in fact, then Governor Knowles, I believe, vetoed it and the Alaska legislature at the time overrode his veto. So that's in essence how it became law. It requires the Board of Game and the department to manage identified ungulate populations for high human harvest. This is one of the areas that, of course, creates a lot of social strife out there by people that don't believe that should be the policy. Like it or not, however, that's the law. So, and we cannot reduce ungulate harvest without enacting intensive management unless it's ineffective based on the science. In other words, we go in front of the board and say, you know, we could do this and cull these predators, but it just isn't going to work in this situation. The biology or the ecology doesn't support it. It's inappropriate based on land management. That's the case down here in southeast Alaska. The um, Forest Service may or may not let us cull wolves on Prince of Wales Island if we wanted to increase deer there, for example. Or it's against the best interest of subsistence users, which is in the law, but I don't think it would really ever apply. And so from that, the board enacts a number of step-down regulations. The first thing that typically happens in terms of areas that have low moose or caribou numbers in particular, but moose really more than anything else, is the hunting seasons are reduced or they're closed. Non-resident hunting is often eliminated. It is now allowed in a few of these areas, but for the most part, non-residents can't hunt in these areas, or if they can, they have very restrictive regulations. Um, wolf hunting is often liberalized, although that doesn't often result in any more wolves being harvested, and bear hunting is liberalized, and likewise, few if any additional bears are often taken under those regulations, liberal regulations. So the restrictions in hunting of ungulates requires the board to consider predator management plans. So we go through this long drawn out affair to get to predator management. Some that are advocates for predator management say it takes too long. In the two or three years it takes you to get one of these programs up and running, your ungulate population is continuing to decline. You need to get on it faster. So, but it doesn't often occur very fast. It takes a few years. There's a lot of public input at board of game meetings. 
and other venues. The goal is allow moose populations to grow towards objectives previously set by the board. And the goals are to reduce predation, where we think predation is a limiting factor. And then we adopt these programs into regulation. They implement them by the department. And then what typically happens is we get sued. So this is where these things end up. They end up in hunting regulations on the state side. And they end up in, uh, at the federal side. There's a whole federal subsistence arena out there. And these things get put into regulations, hunting and uh, other types of regulations that change annually. Well, now I'm going to talk for a few minutes about these intensive management areas and where they are around the state presently. You can count and you can come up with different numbers depending on how you want to count these programs. There are in eight intensive management areas for the purposes of this discussion, this non-lethal program where we uh, sterilized wolves. That program, in fact, no longer exists, but it did, and it resulted in an increase in uh, some of the moose and caribou in that neck of the world. Uh, we have this Unit 20A program where I just finished moose hunting and myself. And there we haven't had predator control for many years, but we, it's very intensively managed. There's cow harvests, there may be calf harvests, and uh, there's high harvest of moose there. In fact, designed to drive the moose population down because now it's above the, what we think is the carrying capacity of the habitat. So we want to drive that population down. That's intensive management, but it doesn't involve any uh, control of wolves or bears. We have the Nelchina Basin, West Cook Inlet. This area I'm going to talk about for a few minutes around McGrath, one of the first areas where we had wolf control. The Middle Kuskokwim down near Antioch, and the Southern Alaska Peninsula Caribou Herd, which is sort of a different case, but I'm going to discuss it nevertheless. There are a number of places in the state where we can't conduct predator control. The 23 million hectares of national parks, preserves, and monuments, um, active predator control will likely never take place on these lands across the state. We also have the 35 million hectares protected in national wildlife refuges around the state. In those areas, state hunting and trapping are allowed. Intensive management, there's nothing that prohibits it except the uh, refuge system and the Fish and Wildlife Service has not allowed us to do it on their land. So basically, for the present time, they're off limits for these programs. This slide overlays a couple different things. First is the pink, or these predator control areas. Then you can see the green, which are the park service units around much of the state. And then you see the yellow, which are the refuges. And basically, the, all these predator control programs we have that are large in scope, uh, none of them take place on any of the federal land units, with the exception of a few uh, Bureau of Land Management lands that are in holdings in some of these areas. Uh, and even where they overlap here, uh, we don't con the programs don't take place on those lands. They're just authorized there, but they don't take place there. So what are the programs we currently have? Here's the example of those areas around the state, just a refresher slide without some of the older areas on it. These are the areas where you have active predator management at this time. Well, how does this actually be implemented? First of all, if you're going to use an airplane affiliated with this, we have to comply with the Federal Airborne Hunting Act. And in fact, there's a desire right now and a letter sent uh, from Governor Parnell just a few days ago to uh, Representative George Miller in the U.S. House of Representatives suggesting that uh, changing that law would be inadvisable and the state of Alaska opposes changing. It's called the PAWS Act. But we go out there and we issue permits to citizens who use personal aircraft. So they conduct these programs in some cases. These are discretionary permits. Not everybody can get one. They're not like hunting permits. And in some of these cases for the last six years, uh, the same day airborne take of wolves occurs, there's land and shoot, and then there's aerial gunnings of wolves. And I'll be the first to admit it's, no problem. it's not very pretty, but it's not hunting. The other thing that happens in some of these places is we have baiting of bears, and now we have snaring of bears. In at least one of these, couple of these places where we have regulations to bait bears, basically some of the rural villages wanted us to put those regulations in place. We did. Few, if any, individuals participated in it. The programs didn't work, and basically the board recently in March took them off the books. For those of you that aren't familiar with wolves in a general sense, uh, we have from about eight to 11 or 12,000 wolves in the state of Alaska. 
They occupy virtually all areas of the state except for the ABC Islands, Kodiak Islands, and a few of the other islands. They basically are intact in terms of the range across the continent. And their density is highly variable. The highest densities of wolves in the state are in Prince of Wales Island because of deer. The dynamics are somewhat different. What's the total harvest of wolves around the state? Well, it fluctuates at about 1,000 or 1,200 animals a year through hunting and trapping. But really, much of the controversy has to do with what I just put the, circ the oval around there. It's the same air day airborne control program and uh, the controversy associated with how those wolves are culled and whether those programs are effective. We have had little controversy about most of this other hunting and trapping of wolves under general seasons. Well, what kind of science do we have? As I said, this was a National Academy Science Review. There's been other reviews written, and our department has done both long-term and short-term studies for a number of years in many of these areas. There have been wildlife monographs written on the subject and uh, many recent papers coming out on the subject, particularly from our staff in Anchorage and Fairbanks. Well, let me say here from a standpoint of somebody that's been at board meetings and also wears a hat as a scientist, so I wear a couple different hats in my career. Science informs. Science does not decide. Policy decides or law decides. And as I said, parts of the review of this book were good from the standpoint of those that think we're doing good science. Parts of it were critical. The science at the scale of which we try to understand these large ungulate and prey populations is very large and it's costly. And as pointed out in this book and my many others, the social human values may be as or more important than anything else. We'd like to talk about some of these ecological things that are happening out there in the environment, especially about moose in interior Alaska, because that's where much of this controversy takes place. Fire is a dominant feature, as you've learned from reading the newspapers every summer, with regard to these systems. It creates what many think people think are really good moose habitat five to 30 years afterwards. So fire is a key component here. This is the type of habitat that comes in a few years after a fire. It's great moose habitat. It occurs off across vast landscapes, and I dare say that in addition to controlling wolves, it's something we need to understand as biologists so that we make the best, give the best information for policymakers about is it predators that are controlling this moose population or is it things like fire and habitat and habitat change over time? Because fire is certainly a dominant force. This slide shows the fire history across interior Alaska in the last 50 years, put together by some of our staff in Fairbanks. And as you can see, it's very extensive. Millions of acres burn every year. And it's a dominant force on the ecosystem and the landscape out there relative to wildlife habitat. So we can't forget about it. It's not just all about wolves and moose. It's a very complex system. Well, I'd just like to take a few minutes and go through two examples of some of the science that we're bringing to the table in this debate. First is a response of moose to experimental removal of bears and public wolf control efforts in western interior Alaska in the McGrath area. And this is a project that's been gone going for six or seven years. This was the first area where we did active wolf control. And uh, we spent a few million dollars on this research project over the last six, seven years. As I said, the study area is along the Kuskokwim River centered on McGrath, rural Alaska communities of Nikolai, Talida, Takatna, and that part where the uh, Iditarod goes through. The area is uh, about 22,000 square kilometers, and within that we have a small area where we've done all the research and the regulations have changed. This is an area called the EMA, the Experimental Micromanagement Area. And in that area, we did a number of different things. We removed wolves, and in this, in, as shown here in this box, we also moved for quite frankly, what were largely political reasons. We moved 94 black bears, were captured and moved, and, um, and some grizzly bears that were also moved out of that area, you know, a number of miles away, even over 100 miles away. And we did wolf control in that area. First area, we did wolf control, and from 2003 to 2008, anywhere from 27 to 11 wolves were culled each year, many of them taken use in aircraft. And 
Over the years, that area expanded. We put a buffer zone around it, and there's a number of complicated management scenarios that took place there. And the moose season was also closed in that area for uh, four or five years. The local said, we won't harvest any moose in this area, so it was closed. Well, what we did is we had a very ambitious research project there on moose and wolves and bears, and here's some of the moose information I'm going to summarize. We put hundreds of, of uh, radio transmitters on moose calves shortly after they were born, and we looked at their survival and mortality rates. And uh, this is a, so when you put all the collars on an animal, they all have a survival rate of one. They're all alive. And then this goes out from day zero to day 365, one year. How many are alive after one year? 33% in this case. This is in 2001 pre-wolf control. 2002 pre-wolf control, we did the same thing over again. 26% of the moose calves were alive after one year. In 2003, in the intervening period here, we had wolf control and bear, some bear removal. In that year, 52% of the calves survived. We got twice the survival rate. In 2004, we had a very high survival rate, the beginning all the way through till the middle of the winter, and we had a very harsh winter in McGrath. The snow was this deep. Density independent factor, stochastic weather event, killed many of the moose calves. Had nothing to do with predation, had everything to do with weather. So you can get it all right, and you can still get it wrong. And then in 2005, we got intermediate results. In 2006, very high survival rate. Mild winter, high survival. Many of the predators had been removed. So what's the summary from all that data? Well, pre-control, we had a 30% survival rate after a year of these moose calves, and 46% post-control after we removed predators. So did it work? Uh, well, it sure did relative to moose. Moose numbers have increased in the expanded experimental micromanagement area around McGrath from 854 moose in 2001 to 1,600 moose in 2008. The, the population just took right off. We did a number of demographic modeling on this and found that from our radio collar and survey data, we suggest that wolf control uh, in a proportionally larger amount of increased that than did bear removals. So it was largely through our modeling. I mean, so what contributed most of the predation here? Was it bears or was it wolves? It's a complicated system. And through the modeling, um, Mark Keech has, de has determined that it was probably more associated with uh, wolves than it was with bears. Bears only tend to kill moose calves. Wolves kill moose 24-7, 365. So based on the models, we should be able to double the harvest of moose within the expanded area to about 150 moose a year by 2013 and still have continued population growth in the moose population if wolf control is continued. And that's the big one of the debates there. Should you stop wolf control? And if you do, what's going to happen then? Are the moose going to go back down? Or are they going to stabilize at some higher level? Of course, we don't know. It depends on lots of things. So, and then theoretically, black bear reductions could replace wolf control. However, we need to meet several untested assumptions to deal with that. And this paper is, in fact, a manuscript that's going to go off to a journal here probably in the next month or two based on this uh, six, seven years of work. The other area I'd like to talk about briefly is the Southern Alaska Peninsula caribou herd. And uh, the individual who's done that work, Lynn Butler, is in the, in the audience tonight. So I'm using some of his information. Thank you, Lynn. The population size of uh, caribou in this area is 800, and it's presently increasing under predator control. But that's not the way it used to be. Back in 1987, there in the survey work that was done, over 4,000 caribou in this herd. This herd has plummeted greatly over time. We have scattered data points here. You can't get a survey. The weather's terrible out on the Alaska Peninsula, so you can't get very good data every year on caribou numbers. But then through the mid-2000s, the, the population of caribou continued to decline. And here in uh, wolf control began a few years ago. Well, I have some other indications of how bad things are for the southern Alaska Peninsula caribou herd. One of the things that's really 
kind of fouled up about this caribou herd is that this line represents the fall caribou fall bull ratio, that's bulls to 100 cows, and what you really, our management goal is to have about 35 bulls for every 100 cows that are in the population. Well, in the last seven or eight years, that's just fallen right off the table. This herd, the demography and the sex ratio of this herd is completely fouled up. And now we have very few bulls in the population. So there are a number of indicators that we need to do something with this herd, and we did, in fact, do something with this herd. Well, one of the things you have to determine if you're going to do this is, is the range quality okay? Is it really a predation issue? What is it? So we do know that calving occurred in traditional areas on state lands because this area has a lot of National Wildlife Refuge land around it. So we thought we had an opportunity to do something with this caribou population. It was really uh, at a very low level. We knew that the adult female pregnancy rate was very good. 86% of the cows over the age of two were pregnant. We knew that the calves were born, what few calves were born were in good health and no stillbirths were detected. They had good weights and mobility, suggesting their habitat was not limiting. So we had these predation events occurring. This is based on radio collared information. These are the results. When you put radio collars on caribou and you go out and check them and they have mortality on them, this is what you find in the field. So now you have to figure out, well, what are we going to do? Who's the culprit and what, if anything, might we be able to do about this? So we began wolf control a few years ago. This was done by the department, not by the public. We went in and took out a few packs of wolves. We removed the entire pack of wolves, including the wolf pups. That was controversial. Some members of the public didn't like it. We got an instant response because we were extremely surgical in where we went and how we did this program. In fact, we took very few wolves relative to our other programs. So it was very successful. The number of calves produced went way up because the wolf packs right in the calving grounds, they were removed. So what can we conclude and what's the summary from that? We radio collared 65 neonatal caribou calves. We removed 28 wolves from the calving grounds. Calf survival went from less than 1% to 50% in the spring of 2008. And uh, we've, in fact, continued the program in 2009 and um, continue the wolf reduction in that area for at least a few years till we can see what's going on. And one of the other interesting things is here, some people have suggested we should capture these wolf pups and maybe bring them in or give them to other institutions. And one of the difficulties with that is that this is a wolf rabies and zootic area, and you really don't want to handle rabid wolves as you may have seen in the newspaper recently where wolves in western Alaska do have rabies. We've had two cases of that this summer, one of which bit some folks, so that's just a bad place to go. So those were some examples of some of the science we have, and I have a lot more to provide if you're interested. But then we have what I'll call the political process. And, for example, there have been many letters, many lawsuits, lots of other things going on in terms of legal and political process relative to this. This, in fact, was a letter that uh, just came across my desk a few days ago from uh, Governor Parnell to uh, Congressman George Miller associated with the PAW Act of 2009, which stands for Protect America's Wildlife and the State of Alaska's Opposition to It. What are the costs of these programs? Well, they're expensive, I can tell you that. Uh, depending, intensive management in general, which is everything from our staff that work on fire ecology to moose management to and including predator controls in the vicinity of a few million dollars a year we spend on this. We'd spend some of this money whether we had this program or not, but um, it's expensive. In terms of the actual control program, we spend, I don't know, half a million to a million dollars a year maybe, depending on how you count somebody's time and staff time for all these permits, all the legal requests we have, all the public records requests we get for these kind of programs where uh, we try to give all the information out as soon as possible. So it's expensive. So let me conclude with a few things here. First, ungulates are an important food resource for many Alaskans. And how we manage those ungulates is important once you get into rural Alaska and into northern Alaska. Um, from my experience, it's a 
it's a different public mindset and once you get north of Juneau to Anchorage and north relative to how important these food resources are for many Alaskans. Certainly subsistence and intensive management laws require that we have adequate ungulate populations. And of course the real question is what is adequate and can we manage for abundance and higher sustained yield levels and things like that. Those are great challenges relative to this because you have, you have, you know, it's a risky proposition to manage at higher levels. Ungulates in a particular moose do in fact occur in persistent low numbers across much of interior Alaska. And they, uh, some individuals call this a low density equilibrium that occur, can occur with regard to predators and prey. It's fairly well documented in the scientific literature in my point of, in my read of it. And the question is, what if anything can you do about it? Well, certainly one of the things you certainly have to do is understand the habitat and the carrying capacity before you just embark on predator control. So it's, it's complicated from that standpoint. Predation is in fact sometimes a limiting factor. And the question is, can you identify it and can you do something about it and is the habitat adequate to have a response in the in the uh, ungulate. We are certainly, as a Department of Fish and Game, we are heavily investing in these types of studies. And in fact, uh, other federal agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the refuge lands are, are joining us in many of these kind of studies. While they're not actively in, involved in predator control, they're certainly actively working because of their mandates under ANILCA for federal subsistence regulations. So they are very interested in, in rural Alaska and the refuge system and the park service to some extent in understanding these predator-prey systems, even if they're not going to take place on their lands. So I guess as I begin to conclude here, uh, there's a f something I would just uh, took a look at in one of the publications I get as a member of the Wildlife Society and I heard a number of papers on at a recent conference I came back in. And that's the relationship between policy and science. And I, I really think it, it is important to remember that policy is not science. And wildlife management is not purely science. I think wildlife management in the case of this issue is probably, oh, 30% science and 70% other things. So I'll let you read this for a second and see if it forms any questions as I begin to, as I conclude here. I think actually the, the context of this, just so you know, I don't think was with regard to predator management. It was actually with regard to more like land management or resource development, mining, forestry, things like that. But it very much applies to the subject at hand tonight. So I, uh, some individuals thought this would be useful to put up and uh, present to you, and uh, I think it is as well. Well, there's lots of things happening, and this is my last slide, and I would just like to point out that yes, Predator management, predator control, whatever you choose to call it in Alaska is a complicated issue. Lots of things happening, lots of values out there. So if, you, if the ultimate goal is to maintain, sustain, or increase, as many people say we should do, and the law says we should do, these moose, this moose population, there are a lot of factors that are pouring in onto these moose that are standing out there in that cold winter. Uh, certainly there's the habitat. and the necessary carrying capacity for us to understand in a general way how many, how much, how many moose can this range support? 5,000, 15,000? We need to have a realistic number out there. That's a very elusive thing to measure in, in wildlife ecology is carrying capacity, whether it's for a fisheries population or a wildlife population. And we have a number of indirect methods to try to evaluate that. But certainly that's an influence. What can the habitat sustain? Another one is, what is the winter weather? Winter weather in interior Alaska and snowfall are very important determinants to the health of a, uh, a moose herd. You could have it just humming along perfectly and get two bad winters in a row and have lose 50% of your moose. Not unlike what happened here a few years ago to the deer herd on, 
and much of northern southeast. I mean, it's going to take six, seven years for that deer herd to recover from those two bad winters if we don't get another bad one. So, hmm? Good winter. Good, well, <laughs> well, good winter. I'm a skier too, so. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's a, you know, you can, you can have a best management program in the world and weather can be a big determinant in these northern systems, snowfall in particular. Fire is a big determinant on ungulate populations and moose in particular in interior Alaska. Bears like to eat moose calves, both black bears and brown bears. Wolves like to eat moose 24-7, 365. People like to view moose, they like to view wolves, and they really like to view bears. So they have an interest in this management paradigm. Hunters, like myself, like to uh, hunt moose. Few people like to hunt wolves. Few people like to hunt bears. But clearly, a lot of people like to hunt moose for the food. Then we have, so that's the whole ecological system and with some human elements in it. Then we have this whole political process. We have people out there and a diversity of people that have an opinion on how this should be done, what law should be established, what policies should be enacted. They elect people, <laughs> and those people determine who sits on the board again. Some people have suggested that the board is uh, too like-minded and needs more diversity. Lots of letters to the editor, a few a year in ADN about that subject, about the diversity or the lack of diversity as they see it on the board again. And then, in fact, our department is pretty far down on the uh, chain of events as I see it and as it should be because we work for the people of Alaska and try to be good stewards of their wildlife resource. And we, of course, then try to manage this moose herd along with everything else that's going on in here and try to inform the board, try to inform policymakers and the public at large. So that's the job that I have. And at the same time, I'm trying to bring the best science and biology and ecology to the table to inform those people in terms of a science policy discussion, at least what the sideboards are and what the environment can produce. So those are my thoughts for this evening, and I'd be glad to take any questions, even though I answered them all at the beginning. Thanks very much. That was great. Now, I have to ask your indulgence uh, in that we are broadcasting this live as well as taping it, so uh, we need to shuttle the microphone uh, to you in order to record your question, unless, of course, you're completely overwhelmed by the intersection of urge and opportunity and just need to blurt it out. We'll also accept that. But can I ask if there are any questions in the house? I'd like to hear more about the non-lethal program, sterilization, whether it's more or less cost effective and more or less effective at reducing the wolf population. Thanks. Uh, thank you. With regard to the non-lethal program that occurred in 40 mile country for wolves, I think that was better part of 10 years ago now when that took place. Uh, that was done through a planning and a stakeholder process. And in fact, it was an outcome that I don't think the department expected to happen. Um, it turned out to be somewhat effective. Uh, it's very expensive. You got to have, <laughs> you got to fly out there. You got to dart the wolves. You have to sterilize the wolves, and you got to get the right wolves. You got to get the alpha pair. You got to sterilize them, and um, then you have to sort of make sure the trappers don't go in and catch those animals on you, because you want to keep that sterilized pair dominant so nobody else breeds. So there's, a, there's an interface there between the biology and the management that's difficult to maintain. It worked somewhat because we had to keep, and it was done in remote areas where trappers wouldn't go. But it, it was a challenge, and um, it, it, you know, no matter how well you do that, you're going to get some animals are going to breed. And the other thing that's going to happen relative to that program is those wolves might not be breeding, but they're still eating ungulates. Uh, you know, even if they're producing fewer and they're still holding territories. So that's good. That's what you want to have happen. But they're still out there consuming ungulates. And, and that depends, of course, in large part on how big the pack size is. So it, yes, it's theoretically possible. It's not something that's even been embarked upon even now in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. 
Any other questions? I'd like to know what exactly happens to the uh, animals that are actually culled. Are they just left to rot, left out to rot, or actually harvested? Thanks. With regard to the animals that are killed, um, calling it the way it is, um, those that are that are taken by the permittees, like in Nelchina Basin, where there's been a few hundred wolves killed, those are the property of the individual. And so those are all turned in to the state just like if they were trapped. And in fact, we get some other biological information and the hides are then possessed. So in that sense, it's similar to the other programs and relative to the hides. With regard to the, the culling that we've done, um, and especially this year up in uh, 40 Mile, Yukon Charlie, where we went out in a weekend and took over 80 wolves, I think, all those animals were brought back, they're skinned, and there was a multitude of samples taken off of those animals, everything from genetics to parasites to l lice to everything in between. So we tried to get the maximum biological scientific value out of those carcasses that we could. Yeah, you said that they were um, that the Park Service and, fi and Fish and Wildlife Service on refuge land uh, would not allow uh, the predator control. Were there areas of those lands that Fish and Game wanted to extend some of the intensive management units? And if so, what was their justification for not allowing the state to manage the resource? Uh, the answer with regard to the federal lands is I suspect because of various policies or laws or whatever, I, I'm not sure we'll ever do predator control on Park Service units. Um, I mean, that's particularly fitting for their mission and mandate, I guess, in my opinion. I, I may not have that entirely correct. With regard to refuge lands, where other hunting in the Fish and Wildlife Service is a hunting-oriented agency to some extent, um, or to a large extent, the issue is yes. The Board of Game and the Department uh, would like to do some intensive management on some areas. One of the areas that comes to mind is um, the Yukon Flats. And um, that area is very depressed. Uh, moose populations, apparently very good habitat or suitable habitat to increase them. It's virtually completely surrounded by refuge lands. and. Um, uh, so that's a place where it's been proposed a number of times, and the Board of Game just says, we can't get there from here because of the federal nexus. And the department uh, has had a number of discussions for the last few years with uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about the ability to conduct some of these programs on refuge lands. Um, and we will probably, if we're to go down that road, we'll have to do full NEPA analysis, e environmental assessments, environmental impact statements, and the, quite frankly, the, uh, <laughs> the energy to do that is quite daunting relative to the federal nexus on those lands. So on one hand, they don't say it's prohibited. On the other hand, the bureaucracy to get there from here is pretty challenging. Any other questions? Sure. Kim, um, at the beginning you showed the charts of the meat harvest in Southwest and all the rural areas that had the high meat harvest, um, but your maps mostly where the management's going on consisted of the Fairbanks and Anchorage and interior re regions and was not where you're saying the Southwest Harvest is high, our meat eating is high. Well, you're correct. Um, although some of those areas have communities in them with high meat harvest. Um, some of the places in rural Alaska don't have a predator prey problem necessarily. And in northwest Alaska, uh, they either don't have it or they certainly don't come to the board and they're not seeking wolf control or bear control and in, in some of those places, and northwest Alaska especially. I mean, they have the western Arctic caribou herd with hundreds of thousands of animals in it to harvest, so they don't have that area. 
but you're correct. When you, when you do look at a map and you see these five, six predator control areas, uh, when, when they first were adopted six, five, six, seven years ago now, uh, they were off the road system, areas like McGrath, where there was a high dependence on that. And uh, the justification, you know, was associated with rural Alaskans and things like that. I would, I would, having sat there and observed what has happened is uh, some of that is not as clean and clear as it used to be. You know, we have now some predator control in the, just out of the Matsu Valley and uh, Unit 13, which certainly has Copper Center and those kind of rural native communities in it where we're conducting those programs. But, and we also have some programs uh, closer to urban areas now than we did. And, uh, I, you know, so it's, it's not a clean a program as it originally was from my my viewpoint as a student who sat through and observed all that. Let me also say that, you know, the adoption of those programs is, as I said a minute ago, one of those programs I think that we'd like to do it the most in the Yukon Flats, we c it's federal ownership, can't, can't do it there. So what you, if you really take a holistic analysis of this, um, which is our Fairbank staff are doing this from a more general planning and e ecological relationship standpoint, you might draw the map of where we'd have these programs differently than we currently do. And quite frankly, some of these programs come about because there's a political element to them. I in addition to the fact that there's some underlying reasonable biology as well. But, you know, to say there's no politics would be a misnomer. So given what you just said, why don't you redraw the map if, it's, if the, the program is not so necessary in some areas now? And I have a follow-up. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure the program is not, if you will, not necessary. It's, it's that if, if you had a clean map with no land ownership and no politics on it, you would probably draw it differently. But where people live and what their values are certainly drive some of this. So each one of these six, seven programs, they're not the same in terms of how they came about. Uh, their underlying biology and ecological relationships are actually different in, in many of these areas, depending if you're north of the Alaska Range versus south of the Alaska Range. And, you know, that's a, that's a combination of a political process and uh, underlying ecology. I mean, I, I can't change that. <laughs> So what percent of people participating in the, the predator control are out-of-staters and what percent are urban hunters? And if you don't know the answer, how can I find out? The percent of out-of-staters participating in the program is zero. They're not, they can't participate. And, you, and your question was the percentage of urban? I'm not sure how to answer that relative to... I mean, if, if you're a pilot in Glen Allen, how do you get characterized? Um, and you're going out and doing wolf control in the middle of winter. I'm not, you know, certainly there are a number of people in the Matt Valley that have participated in this program. We also have people that live in McGrath that have aircraft that uh, go and take some of these wolves in the Unit 19 in the McGrath area in the Kuskokwim. So that take a bit of data sieving to figure that out in terms of, and then how do you count somebody in terms of where they live? Are they urban or are they rural, you know? Yeah, you're, you're right, they do. It's, but it's not necessarily a good definition or, or one that, No, if you're if you're an individual permitted under the control program as with an aircraft to go call a wolf, you you get a permit and as and it's it defines the boundaries and they're all on GPS locations and they all have GPS in their airplanes, so they know where they are at all times. And they, these are generally areas that are pretty far away from the road system. In fact, if they're along the road system, we say you can't call animals along there, even if the wolves happen to be near the road or near establishments or villages or things like that. So uh, we, we further ratchet down where you can actually go in your aircraft and call these animals. But in many cases, even if you're at the 
Willow Airport, that's where you keep your airport, and you're going out to Unit 13, you may be going 100 miles away to take those animals. In the areas that you decide to cull the, uh, uh, the predators, what is the ratio of predator to prey and what is your goal for the ratio of predator to prey when you identify an area? Um, I don't have those ratios at my fingertips. I know that they vary by control program. So if you, if you want that information, I can get it to you. What we operate on isn't the ratio. It's we have specific number of wolves. That, let's say an area has 3,000 moose and 400 wolves. We have a management goal that says, if, like, let's say we have 400 wolves we estimate that are in this area. We want to call 200 of them that winter. Let me emphasize here that when you're in the, particularly for wolves, there's lots of empirical and theoretical data, not all from Alaska, but a lot of it from Alaska, and even from a lot of different researchers, that if you want to reduce a wolf population, wolves are highly fe fecund. They produce lots of pups, and if you want to reduce the wolf population area, you have to harvest 30 to 40 percent of it on an annual basis. And so from a hard science wildlife management standpoint, you really want to take 50 percent of those animals out of that population. Because if you only take 10 or 15 percent, you're actually going to stimulate reproduction and you're going to, ha you're going to get nothing accomplished. And there are many, and in fact that's in the National Academy report. So if you're going to go in and do these programs, you have to be quite frankly, aggressive with regard to wolf harvest because they uh, reproduce very well and when they're culled, they, it stimulates reproduction. So. We have time for one more question. Um, at the time of statehood um, and when our Constitution was written, I think our founding fathers were trying to insulate the Department of Fish and Game from politics. And so they, uh, you know, your commissioner is hired on a different basis than most of the other commissioners. You have boards of fish and game. Do you think the board system has done a, a good job of insulating it from, from politics or is it making it worse? And how do other states manage it uh, as far as just uh, whether they have a board or just the department? Well, I'm going to dodge the first question. You, you, all of you here can be the judge of how political our board process is or isn't. Um, I think it's somewhat political. Um, I do think in many cases, I've sat before the board for many, many days on this subject. And uh, I guess I'm pleased that the, that the board really listens to the department in terms of what the bounds should be for these, at least what the biological sideboards are for this. And in places where these kind of programs, because there's a hue and cry at every board meeting in Anchorage and Fairbanks for more predator control, and the board in many cases turns these programs down. Uh, in, in many cases, quite frankly, based on the advice of the department that, you know, they, they won't work or we don't have the information and so on and so forth. So I think I forgot the second part of your question. Oh, other states. Most other, virtually all the states I'm familiar with in the West, I'm familiar with a lot of them. They have what's called a game commission or a game and fish commission. 49, it, out, of 49 out of 50 have a similar thing. And uh, at least in the Western states that I'm familiar with, they're virtually all appointed by governors. So they have all the same politics that goes on here, whether it's Alabama or Idaho. We do one more burning question. There appears to be one at the front. Well, let's uh, take my discretion here and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, um, I, I know you aren't set up to do this this evening, but it'd be really interesting to look in the deep financials of how this all works. But, but a couple of quick questions. What, would the, what is the cost of culling a wolf? And I have a follow-up question. I, uh, okay. <laughs> the cost of culling a wolf, the cost by the members of the public uh, they have like a super cub and have gone out and done it. The estimates that some of our staff have who have knowledge of what it costs to run an airplane is at least a couple hundred bucks a wolf. 
they don't make any money if they sell the hide or whatever. It's a losing proposition for those individuals. That's why many of them live off the road system. They've hunted in the area for years, and they just view it as a way to try to help what they view as good wildlife management. Uh, with regard to the cost for us to cull wolves, uh, about a thousand bucks a wolf. At least that's what it cost us when we used helicopters up in the uh, 40 mile Yukon Charlie area. I'm, I'm a commercial pilot, so I understand the cost of airplanes. So I assume the cost per pound of moose meat harvest goes down? So what, what, what is that savings? How does this financially all work out? I think depending on how you do the math and where you live in Alaska, either f the finances don't work out in many cases. So would you be better off just keep giving people cow meat maybe and do it at a lower cost rate? If, if, you, if you went to Bush, Alaska and suggested anything like that, you'd get run out of town on your ear. That would be highly insulting to many native Alaskans. I, I understand how it could be insulting. But actually, you know, I won't go back. I won't say what I was about to say regarding that last quote that you put up there. That has been used in many, many countries, having spent a lot of my life in third world countries to justify a lot of things. That it's, it's not the science, it's the value that people place on things. Thank you. Well, I hope you'll join me in, in uh, thanking Dr. Titus for his comments. I know there are additional questions, but I'm sure uh, Dr. Titus will be willing to answer a couple of them. But please join me in thanking our guests.